Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as always, we are very grateful that you're here. Uh, we certainly would not be able to present this festival as we have. This is our seventh year, these many years, without your support and your attendance. It certainly means a lot to us. We are especially grateful for the support of our lead sponsors, uh, the Nantucket Athenaeum, the um, Inquirer and Mirror, the White Elephant, and um, many others tonight, today, especially Fairwinds Counseling Service. We were sponsoring Andrew Solomon's presentation. Uh, we uh, cannot present these presentations by these authors without charge, without our supporters, and without your attendance. So thank you. Thank you for being with us. We will, um, Andrew will be signing books which are for sale after this presentation is over. Uh, please take part of that. We, we certainly hope you will. And please silence your, your telephones. Uh, I want to give you now uh, to Sandra De Alberti, who is the Executive Director for Fairwinds Nantucket Counseling Service, to introduce Andrew Solomon. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, as Theron said, my name is Tassandra Dale Verdi, and I'm the Executive Director of Fairwinds, Nantucket's Counseling Center. More than 65 years ago, our community pulled together and founded our private not-for-profit mental health and substance use agency clinic and wanted to make sure everyone on this little rock could see treatment providers regardless of ability to pay, language they spoke, or country of origin. Today, we remain steadfast in serving 700 families a year and offering a beacon of hope and a safety net to all. It's also our mission to bring vital conversations that matter to our community. It is my great honor to introduce Andrew Solomon to the Nantucket Book Festival, talking specifically about Far From the Tree. Most of you know him as a distinguished clinical professor in psychology from Columbia University Medical Center as well as his numerous accolades and awards, including a Pulitzer Prize, a National Book Critic Circle, Ansel Wolf Book Award, Dayton Literary Peace Prize, and J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize, to name a few. Why it matters to me and why it matters to Fairwinds is that this is a topic that hits home for our community, especially around depression and accessing treatment, as well as this complicated journey called life in our families. Um, most poignantly, some of Andrew's TED Talks and the lasting things I'd like to leave you with is depression is a secret we all share. How some of the worst moments define us and love, no matter what, is what we leave as hope. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Solomon. Well, thanks you all for coming inside on such a bright, glorious day. Um, it would be so lovely to be out. Uh, even in purely non-religious terms, homosexuality represents a misuse of the sexual faculty. It is a pathetic little second-rate substitute for reality, a pitiable flight from life. As such, it deserves no glamorization, no rationalization, and above all, no pretense that it is anything but a pernicious sickness. That's Time Magazine in 1966, when I was three years old. And now, as you know, gay marriage is the law of the land. And I set out to write this book, determined to understand how that shift had taken place. How did something that was universally understood to be an illness come instead to be viewed as an identity? And if the illness of homosexuality could morph into the identity of gayness, then what other illnesses were there out there waiting to make a similar transition? When I was about six years old, I went with my mother and my brother to a shoe store in New York. The name might not go down so well today. It was called Indian Walk Shoes on Madison and 75th. And uh, when we had finished getting our shoes fitted, my brother and I were each told that we could have a balloon to take home. And my brother wanted a red balloon, and I wanted a pink balloon. <laughs> and my mother said that she thought I'd really rather have a blue balloon. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I really wanted the pink balloon. And she reminded me that my favorite color was blue. 
The fact that my favorite color now is blue, but I'm still gay, <laughs> will give you some feeling for a mother's influence and its limits. <laughs> when I was growing up, my mother used to say over and over again, the love for your children is like no other feeling in the world. And until you have children, you don't know what it feels like. And when I was very little, I took that as a great compliment. It meant that being mother to my brother and me had been the great fulfillment of her life. And when I was an adolescent, and she said it, it made me anxious, because I thought I, I might be gay, and if I'm gay, then I won't be having children. And when I came out, and she said it, it made me angry, and I said, you know, that's not the path I'm on, and I want you to stop saying that. But she never did. The love for your children is unlike any other feeling in the world. And until you have children, you don't know what it feels like. When I was writing in 1994 for the Times Magazine, my editors there asked me to do an article about deaf culture. And I was very taken aback. I had always thought of deafness entirely as a disability. Those poor people, they can't hear. What can we do for them? It had never occurred to me that it was a culture. But I went out into the deaf world to do my research. And I went to deaf clubs, and I went to deaf theater, and I went into households where the dog understood sign language. And bit by bit, I got immersed, and I came to realize that deafness really was a culture. I even went to the Miss Deaf America contest, which was held in Nashville, Tennessee, where everyone complained about that slurry southern signing. And then I remember the moment of going to a meeting at the National Association of the Deaf. It was in a gigantic room the size of this room. I walked in. There were hundreds of conversations flying off the ends of people's hands. And I remember thinking, I wish I were deaf. Which is not to say that I wished I couldn't hear, because my hearing is very useful to me, and I would never want to be without it. But rather, um, it was a way of saying that I was in a culture and I felt like I was the one on the outs and they were the ones who were inside it. And deafness is not only a culture, it's also in many ways a very beautiful and very seductive culture. Um, and then uh, I learned um, that most deaf children are born to hearing parents, that those hearing parents, time out of mind, have tried to get their children to function as much as possible in what they think of as the real world, the hearing world. And that for a lot of those um, uh, children, the discovery of deaf culture comes in adolescence or thereafter, when it emerges as a great liberation for them. And I thought how similar that was to the situation of gay children who are born to straight parents, who by and large try to get them to function in what they see as the mainstream world, and who often discover gay culture in adolescence or thereafter, when it comes as a great liberation to them. And then a friend of a friend of mine had a daughter who was a dwarf. And she began saying, should I bring her up to think she's just like everyone else, but kind of short? Or should I somehow um, uh, give her a sense of dwarf identity and get involved with the little people of America? And as she narrated her bewilderment, I thought, here it is again. Here it is again. A person, a family that perceives itself to be essentially normal with a child whom they perceive to be in some way abnormal. I thought, and here they are again making this effort, this intense effort um, to figure out how to handle this child who's different. And so it was at that point that I came up with what was really ultimately one of the central structuring principles of my work in this area, which is the dynamic between what I've called vertical identities. Vertical identities are passed down generation by generation from parent to child, so your ethnicity, your nationality in most instances, usually your language. These are things that parents have in common with their children, often their faith. Um, and they uh, can some of them be very difficult. Uh, there's no question that in the United States as currently constructed, it is in most places easier to be a white person than to be a person of color. But nobody has suggested that the correct solution to that dynamic would be to do genetic research on how to ensure that the next generation of children born to parents of color come out with blonde hair and blue eyes. Instead, we recognize that there's a flaw in the society and we attempt to address the issue of institutionalized racism. But then there are what I call horizontal identities. Being um, deaf, being a dwarf, 
having Down syndrome or autism or schizophrenia. Um, I wrote about um, families of prodigies who were also quite overwhelmed. Families dealing with children with multiple severe disabilities. I looked at families bringing up children conceived in rape, at families um, uh, bringing up uh, children who committed crimes, and at families of people who are transgender. And in all of these areas, I found that the frequent story, at least, was that the parent didn't have this characteristic in common with their child, and that therefore those were horizontal identities. Horizontal because they have to be learned from a peer group, because they aren't accessible. Um, simply from, um, from one's parents. Um, and so I began investigating these and I realized that one of the primary obligations of parenthood is to change your children. We have to change our children. Not changing our children would be neglect. We have to give them a sense of moral purpose. We have to give them an education. We have to do all kinds of things that change them. But the other part of being a parent is accepting your children and celebrating them for exactly who they are. And some characteristics are easy to understand that you have to celebrate. And some characteristics are easy to understand that you have to change. But a lot falls in a gray and foggy middle. And it was that foggy middle that interested me. How do the decisions get made about whom to change and how to change them? Um, I also came across the idea as I went through this work that there's a real difference between love and acceptance. I had experienced my parents' initial dismay over my sexuality as a lack of love. What I realized over time is that um, it was only a lack of acceptance and that most parents struggle fully to accept their children because no parent, even in the most conventional circumstance, has a child who comes with no surprises. And I've yet to meet any mother or father mm, who doesn't sometimes look at his or her child and say, what planet did you descend from? Uh, acceptance has to come at three levels. There's self-acceptance. There's family acceptance, and there's acceptance by the larger society. And each of them feeds the others. If a child has good self-acceptance, his family will have an easier time accepting him. But if they live in a society which is more open, then it will be easier for the family also to accept this child who's, um, who's different. And I found that parents tended to go through a progression when they discovered that their child had some key difference at a time of diagnosis or recognition. They were mostly outraged, and then they bit by bit became um, uh, bewildered, and then they ended up at celebratory, often at least. And I'd like to say it's a simple linear progress, and once you get to celebratory, you're home free. But they'd get to celebratory, and then there'd be some other problem, some other situation in which the child's difference rose to the surface, and they'd be back at outraged all over again. I'm going to tell you the stories of a few of the people I wrote about, and I'm going to begin with Clinton Brown. Clinton Brown was born with a condition called diastrophic dwarfism, which is an extremely disabling condition. Um, uh, people with diastrophic dwarfism, in addition to being very, very, very short, um, have um, uh, what's called a hitchhiker's thumb that doesn't oppose their fingers correctly. They have many um, neuromuscular problems. And so Clinton was born, and his, um, uh, when he was born, the doctors at the hospital said to his parents, you know, He's in terrible condition. He has this awful disabling condition. He's probably not going to live very long. And it might be easiest if you just left him at the hospital so that he uh, can die quietly here. And his parents actually thought about it for three days. And then his mother said, no, that's my baby. And I'm going to take the baby home. And if he dies after just a few months, at least I'll know I did everything I could. So she took Clint home. and. Um, uh, for the first year, she went to see a variety of doctors who all said, oh my goodness, are you prepared for this? And did you know that that was going to go wrong? And did you recognize the problem of this? And you know, what are you going to do when that happens? And that was all she heard from every doctor she went to. And then despite not having vast educational or economic resources, and despite this being the 19, late 80s, early 90s, before the internet had um, uh, really caught on, she managed to find her way to the best doctor for the treatment of um, skeletal dysplasias and dwarfing conditions in uh, the country, who was Dr. Stephen Kopitz at Johns Hopkins. And she described taking him into Johns Hopkins and uh, Dr. Kopitz picking him up after all of these doctors had predicted so many dire things and holding him up to the light and saying, let me tell you, that's going to be a handsome young man one day. And she talked about how transformative it was. And I always say when I address medical audiences, you have to realize that the language in which you couch something can determine the whole future of the child and of his family. So. Um, 
Dr. Kopitz said that he was going to need a lot of surgery, and in fact, he had 30 major surgical procedures um, by the time that he was 15. And some of them were spinal surgeries in which he had to be completely immobilized for periods of up to a month. And while he was stuck in the hospital having all these surgical procedures, he figured there was nothing else very much to do, so he might as well focus on his schoolwork. So he did focus on his schoolwork, and he turned out to be really good at it. In fact, he turned out to be better at it than anyone in his family had ever been. And uh, he uh, was finally the first member of his family to go to college. And he went off to college. He went off to college at Hofstra, which was not very far from where his parents lived. And he had a specially fitted car that was fitted so that his diminutive, he's less than three feet tall, form um, could actually drive it. And he joined a fraternity, and he lived with his fraternity on campus. And his mother called me one day, and she said, I was driving home from shopping, and I went past a bar. She said, and there was Clinton's car, <laughs> parked outside a bar. And I said to myself, he's three feet tall, they're six feet tall, three beers for them is six beers for him. She said, I wanted to go in there and interfere, but I knew I couldn't do that. So I just rode home and left him 11 messages on his voicemail. <laughs> she said, and then I thought, if someone had told me when he was born that my future worry would be that he would go drinking and driving with his college buddies, I'd have been so thrilled to have that problem. And I said, what do you think you did? What do you think you did that allowed this child who was initially so unpromising to emerge into this adult who is successful and happy and popular and accomplished? And she said, what did we do? We loved him, that's all. Clinton just always had that light in him, and we were lucky enough to be the first to see it there. Um, I'll tell you very briefly about one of the other dwarfs who I worked with, someone named Kiki Peck. She has kinesis dysplasia, which is like diastrophic dwarfism, a very disabling condition. Um, and uh, she doesn't have um, a cartilage in her joints, which means that she effectively had very severe arthritis from the time she was born. It also affects her eyesight, um, which is damaged. But she maintained an aura of incorrigible cheerfulness uh, in all my encounters with her. And her mother, at some point, had to call her children in, and she said, I've been diagnosed with breast cancer, and I think I'm going to be fine, but I'm going to have chemotherapy, and I have to shave my head beforehand. And Kiki said, well, I'll help you shave your head. So she helped her mother shave her head. And when they were finished, Kiki said, and now I'm going to shave my head. And her mother said, what on earth are you talking about? Why would you do that? And she said, I've spent a lot of time being different all by myself. And I know how lonely it can be. And I would like for you to have someone else who's different the same way you are at the same time. She was eight years old. It seemed such an extraordinary thing for an eight-year-old to have conceptualized. And when I look at stories like Clinton Kiki, I feel it's not that they've done well despite having a difference or a disability. It's that they've done well in some ways because of the difference or disability that they have. I'm going to quote to you from one other magazine from the 1960s. This is the Atlantic Monthly in 1969, written by a prominent ethicist, Joseph Fletcher. There is no reason to feel guilty about putting a Down syndrome child away, whether it is put away in the sense of hidden in a sanitarium or in a more responsible, lethal sense. It is sad, yes, dreadful, but it carries no guilt. True guilt rises only from an offense against a person, and a Downs is not a person. Now, the little gasp from um, all of you reflect how much our attitudes have changed. There's been a lot of newspaper ink given to the change in the status of gay people um, over the last 20 years. But there's really been a change in our relationship with difference altogether toward a much greater acceptance than we had previously. Um, and, so, um, uh, and so something like what Joseph Fletcher wrote would now seem unacceptable. Um, but the... Uh, the stories I had when I was looking at people with Down syndrome were similarly um, inspiring. And there was one woman who had worked with children with Down syndrome for years whom I met and who described having lunch in LA with the um, actress who was at that time appearing on the television show Glee with Down syndrome. And she said people were coming up and asking for her autograph. She was a celebrity first 
and a person with a disability second. I never thought I would live to see such a day. And um, I got to know a family, Tom and Karen Robards. They were hard-charging Wall Street types. They had um, their first child early, and they were very shocked when he was born with Down syndrome. And they organized with a few other parents um, because they were dismayed at the educational opportunities available to him. They organized with a few other parents to get um, uh, some teachers together and to get them to teach them. And they managed to persuade the Archdiocese of New York to give them two unused public lavatories that they could turn into classrooms. And from that experiment with a few teachers in public lavatories has grown the Cook Center, which is one of the places um, where the educational strategies that have now allowed many Down syndrome children um, ultimately to live separately from their parents, independently, to have jobs, to be in the larger society, where many of those forms of progress were made. And um, I talked to them about their experience, and I said, look, this has been your life. This is what you've done with your life, is to found the Cook Center and to bring about educational reform. I said, do you wish that you'd never heard of Down syndrome? Do you wish that you'd never before had to encounter it? And Tom said, well, if I could make Down syndrome disappear for our son David, I would make it disappear for David, because I would like him to have an easier life than he has. And I think without Down syndrome, his life would be easier. But speaking for the larger society, I think if all these people went away, it would be a loss. They have something to tell us. And um, Karen Robard said, I'm with Tom. She said, if I could make it go away for David, I would for David to give him an easier life. But speaking for myself, well, I would never have believed 25 years ago when he was diagnosed that I could come to such a point. Speaking for myself, I have. She said, for David, I would shift it in an instant. But for myself, I wouldn't give up these experiences for anything in the world. They've made me a richer, more meaningful life than I could ever possibly have had without them. And I thought that was an extraordinary thing to say, that idea of um, uh, uh, celebrating what she had experienced. And I thought, look at all of these people who are celebrating experiences they've had. Now, we live in a time of social progress in which all these forms of difference are becoming more accepted. But we also live in a time of medical progress. We live in a time of medical process when the cochlear implant, um, a, a device that can be surgically implanted in the brain and connected to a receiver, means that most deaf children born in the United States are not being brought up in that signing culture that I witnessed. We live in a moment when um, a, a new compound called BMN111 is uh, being tested in, uh, to block the gene that causes achondroplasia, the most common form of dwarfism in rodents who have the achondroplasia gene but are given BMN 111, there's growth to full size. The testing in humans is underway. And we live in a time when blood tests will detect genetic anomalies earlier and earlier in pregnancies, allowing people more and more leeway to terminate pregnancies with children with Down syndrome or other so-called genetic defects. And sometimes I feel when I see the encounter of um, social progress and medical progress that I'm seeing, um, as it were, the end of one of those operas where the hero realizes he loves the heroine at the exact moment that she lies expiring on a sofa. <laughs> it's a difficult set of questions. It's a difficult set of questions what it means to have those changes. Um, and I believe in the social progress and I believe in the medical progress, but I wish they were a little bit more awake to each other. Now, one of the people I had working with me on this project was a deaf intern named Jacob Schamberg, whom I wrote about at some length. And Jacob one day sent me an email and he said, well, I'm pretty comfortable with my disability and don't see the cochlear implant as an evil scheme out to destroy deaf culture. I do get a sense of impending extinction. There will always be deaf people worldwide, but there's a real possibility that in the West it will be largely gone within a generation or two. I say largely because there will always be cultural holdouts, um, incurable conditions, uh, immigrants, and so on. But no more people like me. And I remember thinking that sentence, no more people like me, seemed so full of meaning, so heavy with meaning. What would it mean to think no more people like me, to think no more Jews or no more Christians, or to think no more black people, or no more gay people? What would it mean to imagine your entire community simply disappearing out from under you. Um, it led me to the investigation of autism and the question of, again, what we cure and what we celebrate. 
Jim Sinclair is an adult with autism who's written very eloquently about his experiences. He hasn't written much. He doesn't use spoken language at all. Um, he's written only a few short things, but the short things he's written are very powerful. And he said, when someone says, I wish my child did not have autism, what they're really saying is, I wish the autistic child I have did not exist, and I had a different, non-autistic child instead. Read that again. This is what we hear when you mourn over our existence. And this is what we know when you search for a cure, that your fondest wish is that someday we will cease to be, and strangers you can love will move in behind our faces. I interviewed a woman named Betsy Burns um, at some length about her experience with a child with autism. And after several years of interviews, she said to me one day, Cece is the ultimate Zen lesson. Why does Cece have autism? Because Cece has autism. And what is it like being Cece? Being Cece, because no one else is. We'll never know what it's like. It is what it is, it isn't anything else, and maybe you'll never change it, and maybe you should stop trying. And that idea of stopping trying, of moving from cure to acceptance, seemed to me to be a key one. Cece has spoken three times in her life. She had said nothing until she was eight years old, and then one night the family was watching television, and um, uh, someone stood up and turned the TV off, and Cece said, I want the television on. <laughs> and her parents <laughs> looked at each other, ready for their entire lives to change. She said nothing else for two more years, and then she was at a school play, and someone said, what color is the king's robe? And Cece said, the king's robe is purple. So she's spoken only three times, and each time she's spoken, what she said has been appropriate to the situation. But as her mother said, to have a child who has never spoken is to imagine that perhaps the child doesn't even know what language is and has no idea what's going on. But to have a child who's spoken three times is to wonder for the rest of your life what opened up the traffic jam at those moments? What else is there in her waiting to come out? What is it that she's understanding of the world? I was struck by the way that people like Betsy arrived at acceptance, by the way that the other families I've described arrived at acceptance and celebration. And at first it seemed to me to be somewhat artificial. I thought, okay, the robots can say this gave them a meaningful life, but clearly nobody would have ever chosen um, this life that they've had. And then I um, began talking to um, other families, including the families of people who had committed crimes. And I went off to talk to the family of um, uh, Dylan Klebold, who was one of the perpetrators of the Columbine Massacre. Uh, and I was very much um, enmeshed with his family. I took them um, three years of back and forth before they agreed to talk to me. And then once they did, they were so full of their story that they couldn't stop telling it. And um, I remember the first weekend I spent with them. We recorded some 20 hours of interview tape. We were all incredibly exhausted. It was Sunday night. We were sitting in the kitchen and Sue was making dinner. And I said, if Dylan were here now, is there anything you'd want to ask or tell him? And Tom said, Tom Klebold, Dylan's father said, there sure is, I'd want to ask him what the hell he thought he was doing. And Sue Klebold looked down and she thought for a minute and she said, I would ask him to forgive me for being his mother and never knowing what was going on inside his head. And I said later on that I thought that was an extraordinary thing to have said. We were having dinner in Denver, one of many dinners that we had. And she said, you know, when it first happened, I used to wish I had never um, met Tom, I had never gone to Ohio State, these children wouldn't have been born, these terrible things wouldn't have happened. She said, but over time, I've come to feel that I love the children I had so much that I don't want to imagine a life without them, even at the cost of this pain. When I say that, I'm talking about my own pain, of course, not the pain of other people. But life is full of suffering, and this is mine. So while I recognize that the world would have been better off if Dylan had never been born, I've decided that it would not have been better for me. And I thought that was such an extraordinary point to have arrived at. And I thought, how can these parents with these terribly problematical children be so enthusiastic about, um, uh, about having them? And then I realized that if some glorious angel were to drop through the ceiling of this Unitarian church, Methodist church, where are we today? Um, <laughs> of one of these Nantucket churches, um, 
and offer to um, take away the children of the people who have children here and give you other better children who are more attractive, more intelligent, more polite, um, that we would in fact pray away that atrocious spectacle because we become so attached to the children we have. And that the stories of these parents, implausible though they sounded at some level, were not so implausible as lived experience. There was um, someone who observed that we take care of our children, we not only take care of our children because we love them, but also love them because we take care of them. And the process of caretaking in these instances has demanded so much of these parents, and it shouldn't be a surprise that it served to create a profound and lasting bond as well. There was a family I interviewed, David and Sarah Haddon, who live in Connecticut. Um, their first child was born with multiple very severe disabilities. Um, it couldn't walk, couldn't talk, had no control over movement, um, was blind, and the doctor said it was a bizarre genetic anomaly and that it wouldn't happen again. And they had a second child, a daughter who was fine, and then they had another son, and he was born with exactly the same syndrome as the first. And so, um, they brought these children up and they had them live at home for as long as they possibly could. Um, and then when Sarah had an herniated a disc trying to lift one of them out of a bathtub because people with no motor control feel much heavier than people who can assist as you're picking them up. When she herniated a disc, they realized that they would have to get them into um, uh, a group home. And so after a long process, they were able to secure a group home that wasn't too far from where they lived and they went there every day to visit their two sons. And one day, <coughs> excuse me, one day that, yes, water. Um, one day they were, uh, their younger son was being given a bath by one of the attendants in the group home and she left the room to go and get a bath towel, which she was not supposed to do. And the harness he was in gave way and he slipped underwater and he drowned. Um, and I said to Sarah, I said, are you going to sue the, um, uh, the healthcare system at this? And she said, the care of our children is so difficult and so badly paid. She said, I don't want to do anything that will cause other people to avoid this field. And we still have a son who's in that home and he has to do well. So we want this one woman to be removed from the area of childcare um, and to be um, permanently disbarred from doing that because she isn't responsible enough but I didn't want to make a bigger fuss about it than I need to. And then I went to the internment of her son's ashes, where she said, let me bury here the rage I feel to have been twice robbed, once of the child I wanted and once of the son I loved. I was struck by that line, and it reminded me of something that was said to me by another mother of two children with severe disabilities, Ruth Schechter, who said, people always give us these little sayings like, God doesn't give you any more than you can handle. But children like ours are not preordained as a gift. They're a gift because that's what we have chosen. And there was a study done in which women who had had children with a variety of disabilities were interviewed, I think about two weeks after their children were born and asked, do you expect to find meaning in this experience? And um, then all of the women and their children were interviewed again um, eight years later. And the women who had anticipated finding meaning in the experience had children who were doing better on every clinical measure than the women who had not anticipated finding meaning in that experience. And so I learned that experience is something, that meaning rather, is something that gets shaped, that you decide that you're going to find, that you decide that you're going to pursue, and that you decide that you're going to realize. Um, and so I was in the middle of this book when I decided to have children myself. And friends of mine kept saying, how can you be deciding to have children right in the middle of a book about everything that can go wrong? <laughs> and I said, but it's not really a book about everything that can go wrong. It's a book about how much meaning there can be in the experience, even when everything seems to be going wrong. And it, rather than frightening me away from having children, it's propelled me toward it. So I will give you the most um, condensed explanation of my family that I can. My husband is the biological father of two children with some lesbian friends in Minneapolis. My best friend from college um, had gotten divorced but wanted to have a child, and so she and I have a daughter, and mother and daughter and mother's male partner now live in Fort Worth, Texas. 
And then John and I wanted the experience of bringing up a child full-time in our own household. So we have a son of whom I am the biological father, John is the adoptive father, we had an egg donor, and our surrogate was Laura, the lesbian mother of John's two biological children. <laughs> So the shorthand is six parents of four children in three states. <laughs> and there are people who seem to think that the existence of families such as mine somehow undermines the integrity of families such as theirs. And I don't accept those subtractive models of love, only additive ones. And I believe that in the same sense that we need species diversity to sustain the planet, so we need this diversity of kinds of affection to sustain the ecosphere of kindness. Now, the day that our son was born was, of course, a joyful day. Um, we were all very excited. And then the next day, the pediatrician came in. And she said she was concerned. And I said, oh. And she said, he's not extending his legs correctly. And I said, oh. And she said, that could be an indication of neurological damage. And insofar as he is extending them, he's doing so asymmetrically, which could reflect um, a mass in his brain. And additionally, he's got a very large head and should be tested for hydrocephalus. And I felt the whole core of my being pouring out onto the floor of that hospital room. And so we set off to do the variety of tests that we were being called on to do. And as we went along, looking at those various things, at the MRI and the CAT scan and the arterial blood draw, I realized that I um, had been writing about all of these parents, but I did not want to join their number. And I was angry and I was upset and I wanted George to be okay. And then I realized that I was thinking in terms of illness and that these things were illnesses um, to me, um, but that if they turned out any of them to test as we thought they might, that they would become his identity. And his identity um, would be one that I would share because if he was gonna have a disability, I was gonna join the ranks of all those parents I had met and admired whose ranks I didn't want to join. And I suddenly heard this voice in the back of my mind that said to me, the love for your children is unlike any other feeling in the world. And until you have children, you don't know what it feels like. So we went through about four hours of this. And at the end, we went back up um, to get the results. And we sat in the pediatrician's office and with some fanfare, she told us that he uh, had tested fine on every one of those tests and that he was now extending his legs perfectly correctly and we had nothing to worry about. And when I said, what did she think had been going on in the morning, she said he had probably had a cramp. <laughs> children, children had ensnared me in the moment that I connected fatherhood to loss. But if I hadn't been in the midst of this research, I'm not sure I would have noticed it. I had met so many of these parents who had decided to take a lifetime's voyage with their damaged children, trying to create identity out of misery. And though I admired them, I had also at some level thought they might be fools. But that day in the hospital with George, I discovered that my research had built me a plank and that I was ready to join them on their ship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We have just a few minutes for me to take some questions, if anyone has questions. Um, I see someone at the back with an arm up already. Yes. I'm sorry, someone is approaching with the microphone and then I'll be able to hear what you've said. How? So, so things that we, so you talked about how things that we once regarded as illness, we now regard as parts of our identity. How do you see this maybe in the future as applying to things that we currently still see as mental illnesses, including things like depression? Well, look, in any instance, you're looking at um, two issues with any of the conditions I've talked about, um, which are 
Um, is the sense of disability created by the society or is it created through the experience of the individual? So, for example, um, if you're deaf and you therefore can't um, uh, ask for help when you're in the hospital, the hospital can provide translators and that problem will go away. That's a culturally constructed problem. If you're disabled and there are no ramps anywhere and you can't get in and out of the buildings you need to get in and out of, that's a cultural problem that's been set up. On the other hand, if you have depression, depression is inherently painful. I mean, depression is an identity. I've written about it. It's part of my identity. It's important to understand it as an identity. Um, but the, understanding it completely as an identity will not make the pain of it go away, because the pain of it is inherent. The pain of schizophrenia is inherent. There are these things in which the pain is absolutely inherent and cannot be escaped from. So you can say about autism that we should have a broader range of what's accepted and that at least um, people who are autistic but seem to be able to function in the world should be more readily accepted for what may seem sometimes like their peculiar point of view. I think with depression, it helps for it to be an identity and it helps when people can be open about it, but making it, seeing it as an identity will not cure the underlying anguish of the condition. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone? Ah, there we are. The microphone's just coming. Thank you. I just identified with one item. Uh, well, it shouldn't be an item, but um, with regard to the child that all of a sudden has said uh, to, uh, oh, uh, to turn on the TV. Okay. I have a neighbor that I do help. She has a 25-year-old gal, and um, she, we really connect tremendously, um, especially when she sees me. She hugs me that I have to catch my breath because she's, I'm very short, and she's much taller than I. And she does say two things, and that is, I have to go home. I have work to do. That, but. I said, Emmy, you are home. And she keeps repeating that. And then the word 13, as clear as can be. Um, I, don't, I, I try to help her further because she does understand what I say, but she cannot communicate any further than those two items. Has she learned to write or to type? No, she doesn't like, it's very challenging for me because I often spend four hours with her. She does not like TV. She doesn't like me to read. She does do puzzles, okay, which she does pretty well. But by this time, she knows them, you know, and because she, she only favors a few. Uh, farming part, um, farming uh, uh, puzzles and um, uh, also um, uh, some other items, but um, I, I don't know what else you can advise me because we really have connected tremendously. Well, it's wonderful that you connected. Wonderful for you, I hope, and certainly wonderful for her. Mm -hmm. I think the thing is to try to identify what will make her happy. I mean, there was one mother of children with um, rather severe disabilities who said to me, um, if I had been given one wish on the day my son was born, the wish would have been that my children be happy, not that they go to Harvard. She's a very and it happy would have child. come true. She's but very happy. If she's a very happy child, I would sort of I would stick with the things that make her happy, even if they seem repetitive and dull to you. Well, it's tremendously repetitive, but also spending four hours with her is really tremendous on my part because I feel so exhausted. I also found that um, in my junk mail, where you have these little stickers, I have them stick that onto the paper. When I bring them over, she's so excited because this is one of the things. But I can't read to her. We can't see a program. It's just I'm so limited. Um, Don't fight against those limitations all the time. Um, accept those as the limitations within which the relationship has to unfold and engage with them, as I say, in the ways that make her happiest. She does understand everything I say to her, but she can't express herself other than those two items, that she has work to do. She's 
got to go home. But right. I said, Emmy, you are home. Right. You know, and then the. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I love your talk. I love your books. Um, I'm really grateful to Fairwinds for bringing you here. Um, and the whole subject of depression, and especially in the light of the public suicides over the last few weeks, and it's uh, depression and recovery is an area that I care a lot about and, and see it, uh, uh, depression and addiction on this island a lot. Um, and it's interesting that Fairwinds has, is the center on the island for these issues and the hospital itself doesn't have those facilities. And I'm wondering if you've seen, with a lot of your writing and, and, and uh, interest in this area, the stigma, um, do you think the stigma has gotten better around the issues of depression and mental health? Um, I, I, I still wonder, it, it seems like there's still a lot of, uh, of the stigma out there about these issues and people being shocked and all kinds of things. And I was just wondering if you see that. It's much better than it was, and it's got an enormously long way to go. I mean, it's gotten better than it was in part because of the immersion of, um, uh, emergence rather, of uh, medications that are helpful to people with depression. So in 1950, if you announced to people that you were depressed, they knew you were depressed, but there was nothing much that could be done about it. And now there are a lot more approaches to fix somebody's depression um, than there were at that time. Um, the stigma has gotten less because of a generation of activists who have really battled against stigma and who have made a real point of trying to open up the conversation. Um, and we have a more confessional society than we did, and that's come via social media and via the internet and all kinds of other ways. If you're depressed now, you can find a community of depressed people in about 30 seconds by typing depression into Google. So there have been real changes in those regards. But it is still the case that less than half of people who have major depression will identify that they have it. Less than half of those who identify it will seek treatment. Less than half of those who get treatment will get appropriate treatment. And less than half of those who get appropriate treatment will get it for long enough. So the number of people who are actually being treated effectively is now a tiny fraction of the number of people who could stand to be treated effectively. And that's a real social misfortune. And so the fight against stigma has to be an ongoing and, and urgent one. And, and do you see the same thing with addiction? I mean, you're out there in these fields all, all the time. Yes, I mean, addiction, I think, has been destigmatized more gradually and in part through AA, um, but uh, uh, there still are, you know, an enormous number of people who have addiction who aren't receiving the help they should be receiving, and it's in part because of issues of shame. Yeah. Suicide. Do you have any observations on the reported level of suicide in this country? Well, yes, I just did a, a short piece for The New Yorker on um, uh, the Kate Spade, Anthony Bourdain um, uh, uh, deaths, and then the report from the Centers for Disease Control um, that reflects uh, increasing rates of suicide in this country. I would say the primary culprit in increasing rates of suicide is ease of access to the means of suicide. Um, more people die of gun suicide than of gun homicide. More policemen commit suicide than are killed in action. More firemen commit suicide than die in fires. Um, and more of the military commit suicide than die um, uh, on the front. And so I think there's just this enormously high rate of suicide. And I think the ease of access to guns has enormously increased the rate of suicide. If you take the means of suicide and make them farther away from people, people often overcome the impulse towards suicide before they go. They also reflect a lot of untreated mental illness. I explained in answering the previous question how much untreated mental illness there is. So depression plays a role. You know, usually in a suicide, you have life circumstances and you have vulnerability, and they come together. And some people are incredibly vulnerable, and it takes only minor life circumstances to drive them to suicide. And some people are much more resilient, and it takes much more extreme life circumstances. I also think that we're living in a time when hatred and non-acceptance have become uh, inscribed in a lot of government policy, and I think that is having an enormous effect on people and making people feel unsafe and insecure and anxious, and that that kind of unsafety and insecurity leads some people who are in desperate shape to suicide. So there are a variety of factors that are influencing that. 
I'm going to do one more question, I think. Um, my goodness, there are. treatment of depression has been the discrediting of ECT. That is, can be a life-saving intervention, treatment of choice for psychotic depression, which is often involved in suicides and suicide homicides. There's no question that ECT is a very, very effective uh, remedy to uh, depression. Probably the most effective we have, if not the most pleasant that we have, um, and I believe its use is now really making a strong comeback. There was someone just here who had a question. When you um, were doing your research on the children and the parents, did you come across parents who were suffering depression? And if so, how did you, how did you handle that situation? There was an interesting research project done at Columbia in which they tried to figure out for children who were depressed what the best interventions were. And they tried medication and they tried various... Actually, I actually wasn't asking about the children who were the depressed. I was asking when you were doing your research into the children who had the, the dwarfism and um, the, the problems, um, uh, the medical problems, did you, did you encounter parents who were dealing with these children who had depression? Yes. And how did that work out? So, so what I was starting to say by way of response was to describe this research at Columbia where they were looking at it um, addressing depression in children. And they found that the most effective way to address depression in children was to treat their mothers. Um, and so when I was looking at families of children who had these differences, almost all of them had gone through some level of depression or despair about it. It is not easy news to discover that you have a child who has a very severe disability, but a lot of them understood that they needed to protect their children as much as possible from that depression. Um, those who were not able to do so, um, uh, you know, it can weigh heavily on the children. There was one dwarf who I got to know quite well whose mother had a nervous breakdown when she discovered she had given birth to a dwarf and spent much of the rest of her life in psychiatric hospitals, and it weighed very, very heavily on that child. So um, the sense that your mere existence, instead of giving your parents infinite joy, has given them that level of distress and stress for people who are children who have the consciousness to process these emotional realities is, um, is a, very real, um, a very real problem. Um, but, you know, children themselves are resilient and they came through surprisingly well and often. So, um, I'm happy to uh, answer more questions in the back while I'm signing books. I look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much for coming on this show. Thank you. <laughs>